In this week's drive, we see a race where the team wins and loses. Look at 50 years of a legend. Watch as even the best drivers do it alone. And find that going fast on two wheels can win you four. All this and more in this week's Drive. In the super fast world of Formula One, the slightest change in a car's performance can mean the difference between victory and defeat. All the teams are using the latest computer software to give their drivers the best chance of winning. The Jaguar team uses computer modeling to measure the driver's body and create a virtual reality model and design a cockpit optimized for the driver's height and reach. Finding the most comfortable position for the driver will reduce fatigue and give him that crucial edge over his rivals. What we're working towards is to try and find elbow clearances, uh, the right angle of the elbows, if you like, towards uh, obviously the wheel and, and yourself or the shoulders to make sure you have a very good position throughout the race to, to have the right strength and comfort. Formula One cars are increasingly made to measure, especially for drivers like Weber, who stands six feet tall. Uncommonly tall in Formula One, but still three inches shorter than his new teammate Justin Wilson. The driver's got now a command centre in his hands. He's got to be able to reach that easily. He's got to be able to see the right buttons to press. He almost can do them with his eyes closed. Normally, it's the cutting-edge technology of racing that eventually feeds into ordinary car design. But in this case, the computer simulation technology was originally developed for use in Jaguar's road cars and is being adapted to Formula One. At the rival Williams team, technicians use telemetry to monitor the performance of the car throughout a testing session or race, identifying problems and radioing instructions to the driver. The steering wheel in a car is worth a fortune, and even the layout of the buttons is down to the driver's preference. The car's covered in sensors, measuring everything that's happening, be it the engine speed, the driver's throttle opening, position of the steering wheel, pressures in various critical parts of the car, temperatures all over the place, sensors for wear, all sorts of things. All of that data is centralised, digitised and then transmitted by telemetry back to the pits so that it can be analysed by the engineers and the data used to improve the performance of the car and its reliability. For Williams and Juan Pablo Montoya, it all seems to be working. Despite constantly changing rules within motor racing, technology looks set to steadily improve conditions for drivers and car performance. The DTM series moved back to Germany and the Nürburgring for the seventh of the 10 round championship. Matthias Ekstrom started on pole for the 41 lap race in his Audi. Reigning champion Laurent Aiello shared the front row with his teammate and the Frenchman grabbed the lead before the first corner and Dutchman Christian Albers in a Mercedes-Benz was in third place. Their team owner, Christian Abt, spun in the first corner. He managed to get back into the race but retired on lap 15. Britain's Peter Dumbreck in an Opel started from fifth position and fell off the track all by himself on lap 10. He recovered to finish 10th. Martin Tomzik was forced to retire his Audi when he made a pit stop after 13 laps. Mamal Reiter nearly collected an unusual trophy as he spun, a marshal stupid enough to be on the outside of a corner which had already had an incident. On lap 21, Naiello came into the pits for the second time in the lead, but he didn't lose too much time and was able to get back out still in front. There was a battle developing behind Aiello for the other podium places between Bernd Schneider and Christian Albers. Mercedes-Benz teammates diced with the German holding second place and then being passed by the Dutchman. Aiello took his first DTM win of the season and Albers held off his teammate Schneider to take second place. Schneider leads the title with 49 points, one ahead of Albers. Jeff Gordon might have had the best car, but the worst luck at Watkins Glen. He started on pole but was stoned last after one lap because Greg Biffle tapped him from behind and spun him out at the first corner. And then another crash before the first lap was completed. Kyle Petty ran right into the big styrofoam wall. 
Despite the dense traffic, tight chicane and big padding blocks, it was still a heavy hit, but he was able to drive back to the pits. Full course caution. On lap 44, Steve Park gave Christian Fittipaldi a gentle tap. He got going again to finish 40th, 10 laps down. All right, what happened Despite this Wallace? big whack for Rusty Wallace on lap 51, he finished 37th, six laps down. But Kenny Robbie Gordon pitted for fuel two laps ahead of most other drivers. This gave him a clear track, and he held the lead for the last 39 laps of the race. But as he crossed the finish line, there was more trouble right behind him. Four-time series champion Jeff Gordon, who had spent the whole race trying to overcome his first lap spin, fought up to third place, but he ran out of fuel on the final turn and was pushed into the wall by Kevin Harvick and back to 33rd place. The win moves Robbie to 10th in the championship. Matt Kenseth leads from Dale Earnhardt and Jeff Gordon. Channel. It was a perfect day for racing at Mid-Ohio and Paul Tracy in the pole position for the fifth time in 13 races. Rookie Ryan hunter Ray achieved a career best by qualifying second fastest in the rookie team's unfashionable last year's Reynard chassis. Bruno Jonquera fell victim to an aggressive move by Oriol Sevilla on lap 13, ending Bruno's lead in the kart standings after exactly one race. Sevilla got a run on Jonquera out of turn one and dived to the inside, but touched the curb and bounced into Jonquera. Sevilla retired while Jonquera resumed two laps down. Jimmy Vassar started 14th, got to fourth, then lost it eight laps from the end, although he did set the fastest lap. 96 kart champion Vassar was upset with himself after throwing away what would have been his best result of the season. Tracy pulled away from the field to take a big lead from the start and led for 69 of the 92 laps. He won by 0.61 of a second from countryman and teammate Patrick Carpentier, who won the race last year and was third in 2001. The Canadian's victory gave him a 20-point lead in the driver standings over Jonquera. Hunter Ray's third place made him the first American rookie on a champ car podium since Eddie Cheever back in 1990. This year sees the 50th anniversary of the Chevrolet Corvette. The first Corvette was driven off the production line on June the 30th, 1953 by Tony Kleber a humble Chevy worker now famous as the first man to drive the first Corvette. The Corvette was the brainchild of legendary designer Harley Earl, who penned the 1927 Cadillac LaSalle. Working in a secret studio, Earl created an American version of the European sports cars, MGs, Jaguars and Porsches. The 1953 Corvette, named after a type of British warship and made of one of the new wartime materials, fiberglass, was a two-seater convertible with a wraparound windscreen. Only 300 were made that year, all of them white with a red vinyl interior. At $3,498, they were expensive, about the price of a big Buick. John Wayne bought one. They were beautiful, but they weren't very good. They had a gutless six-cylinder engine and an automatic gearbox. The roof leaked and the suspension was lousy. In 1954, Chevy built 3,000 Corvettes, but a third went unsold. In 1955, production was cut to just 700. The Corvette was dying. It was saved by the competition. In 1955, Ford introduced the Thunderbird. It had a powerful V8 and sold 15,000 that year. Chevy streamlined the Corvette and fitted a V8 engine. The 56 VET became the first American sports car clocked at 150 miles an hour at Daytona. The Corvette caught on and the T-Bird became a four-seater. The Corvette was long and low and sleek and it looked like a shark or a stingray. Both names were used. In 1962, GM gave Corvettes to six of the seven original Mercury astronauts. John Glenn declined. Over the next four decades, the Corvette went through five redesigns and the best-selling Corvette in history was the 1979 model, with more than 53,000 sold. Latest in the line is the Corvette Z06 with a 5.7-litre V8 
a six-speed gearbox and a claimed 175 miles an hour capability. Born the same year as Playboy magazine, the Corvette captured the slick, cool style of the Rat Pack, JFK, James Bond, Miles Davis, surfing and rock and roll. People came from around the world to watch the 1956 12-hour Florida sports car race at Sebring. Here gather the great sports cars of Europe. Ferrari, Jaguar, Alfa Romeo among them, and a sensational newcomer, America's only authentic sports car, Chevrolet's Corvette. Only a year ago, with predecessors of this sleek, hand-built, brand-new Corvette Supersport, Chevrolet made its debut in international sports car racing, and a Corvette placed among the first ten. Two other Corvettes successfully completed America's most grueling race. Now Corvette is back, meeting the exacting standards of the Federation Internationale de l'Automobile with production models and with this experimental car, the prototype Corvette Super Sport, challenging the future. It's more than a contender. It's a study in new ideas to be tested over a tough course. A 300-plus horsepower collector of engineering data to be gathered in a single race. The 50th anniversary edition comes as either a coupe or a roadster with the performance of the regular Corvette, with selective ride control suspension, unique red paint, badges and aluminium wheels. The anniversary edition comes with two roof panels, one glass and one painted to match the body. Inside, 50th anniversary badges and special floor mats complete the look. After a summer break, MotoGP champion Valentino Rossi was keen to end the worst drought in his racing career. No wins in four races. He went out onto the circuit in qualifying, knowing he had just minutes of the session left if he was to claim top spot. Arch rival Max Biaggi was on provisional pole after Friday's session and had held it for most of Saturday. The Italian fired in a lap 0.13 second faster to beat his countrymen and claim top spot. It was the Italian's fifth pole position this season. Then, Spaniard Sete Gibernau, also riding a Honda, hit the track. Gibernau, who won the last race in Germany to close the gap on Rossi at the top of the standings to just 29 points, was just over a tenth of a second behind for second on the grid. Biagi's main downfall had been an early crash which destroyed his primary bike and forced him to use his less favoured backup machine. But despite that setback, he still took third on the grid. Max has had seven career wins at Bruno in the 250 and 500cc classes. Earlier, Japan's Shinya Nakano was taken to hospital with concussion after high-siding in morning free practice. The 25-year-old Yamaha rider was conscious, but further checks were needed. Ducati's Loris Caparossi completed the front row. For tomorrow, anyway, uh, will be very hard because the first, all the first lane is under 59 and uh, we need to, to make the, some choice, like the tires for the race and some, some different setting for tomorrow morning. I hope have the good weather. Ciao. Championship leader Manuel Poggiali set pole position in the 250cc category. The session was ended a few minutes early when Australia's Anthony West crashed and fractured his ankle, and the sudden end to the session deprived the front riders of some of their fastest times. West started on the second row but retired after three laps. France's Randy de Punier was second, sending a reminder of his potential. The Frenchman has dropped vital places in the title, claiming just 24 points from the last three races, but is only 24 points behind Poggiali. Fonzi Nieto of Spain was third, ahead of Tony Elias and Franco Bottini, all on Aprilias. Elias won the 125cc race here in 2001, but has gone five races without a podium after back-to-back -back wins in Spain and France earlier in the year. Alex de Angelis took pole for the first time since the opening race at Suzuka. He finished eighth here last year after starting from pole for the first time in his career. His qualifying time is the fastest ever lap of Bruneau by a 125. Steve Yankner's second on the grid was his best ever qualifying result, and he narrowly missed out on claiming pole. Last year's winner, Lucio Cecinello, has finished in the top five at the last six Czech Grand Prix. 
Dani Pedrosa has finished in the top five 18 times since the start of 2002, including 13 podiums. Although he hasn't won a race in a while, Valentino Rossi's consistency has helped him maintain his lead in the championship standings. Going into the race at Bruneau, he had finished in the top three, on the podium, in the last 15 rounds. And the last time he failed to take a top three spot was at this circuit last year. Rossi quickly saw his pole position negated as championship rival Gibernau made a rapid start, but it was the Ducati of Troy Bayliss that led into the first corner. That set the tone for a pulsating race, with Gibernau, Rossi and the Ducatis of Bayliss and Loris Caparossi all vying for the lead. The outcome of the race hung squarely in the balance as the quartet traded positions and racing lines with regularity. Caparossi was forced out with mechanical trouble on the penultimate lap before the race finished with one final dramatic twist. Gibernau held a minute lead over Rossi going into the last corner, but the Italian just crept past him on the inside before charging to the line with his rival less than a wheel behind. It was an incredible ending to a brilliant race, Rossi once again showing the fighting qualities that have made him world champion. So today I think, uh, for sure for me, but also for everybody, is one of the best race of the year. Because uh, for the first time maybe this year or the second, we fight without uh, tactics, without thinking. Everyone uh, go 100% from the first lap to the end, straight away, without thinking, only I want to stay in front, no, I want to stay in front. So the fun uh, from the bike is, was very, very good. Rossi opens up the gap on Gibernau as Biagi, who finished fifth, nine seconds off the pace, slips out of contention, and rookie Bayliss closes on Caparossi. Randy Depunier won the finest race of his short 250 career after a duel with Elias and Poggiali. The Aprilia trio pulled away from the pack midway through the 20-lap race, and their battle had too many lead changes to count. Randy carved a small margin as Elias and Poggiali tripped themselves up, chasing second place, helping the Frenchman to score his second win of the season. Any one of the top five could easily emerge as world champion this year, with the battle for second place just as intense. In the 1-2-5 race, Pablo Nieto went down and Thomas Luti had nowhere to go. Both were among the leaders. Moments later, Cecinello's bike seized, bringing down Jenkner too. After all the action, Dani Pedrosa rode a confident race, leading Perugini for the last six laps, contrasting the early laps when six riders squabbled for position. The Spanish 17-year-old is looking good for his first world title, although with another six rounds to go, anything can happen. Any of the top six can race at the front of this pack. One of only three companies in the world to mass-produce both cars and motorcycles is offering an unusual prize. BMW will give away a top-line BMW Z4 Cabrio to the MotoGP rider who scores the lowest time in the sum of all the qualifying sessions at all 17 rounds throughout the year. The Z4 boasts a six-cylinder, three-liter engine with a host of technological and engineering advances. I do believe that there are equal opportunities for all, that we really have an attractive prize, that every top rider has a shot at. We know it is a tight race up front. Not everyone to have a pole will have the best time in the sum. At the first test session, we had Loris Caparossi as our winner. That won him a BMW 330CD. He was fastest on his Ducati in Barcelona. That was the start of our BMW award, and it was pretty successful. In fact, Loris won the car and promptly gave it away to one of the Ducati team mechanics. The pre-season testing session was the first indication of the pace of the all-new Ducati team. In their first foray into Grand Prix racing in over 30 years, the tiny Italian factory has brushed aside the Suzuki, Yamaha and Kawasaki efforts and taken the fight right up to mighty Honda. Well, Valentino, uh, as you know, BMW has created a award for the best qualifying, and that is, of course, uh, uh, by accumulating the lap times of every qualifying session by every rider. What do you think about this award, of course, by winning a Z4 if you do the, the best? For, for me, it's a great idea. 
Uh, first, the, the system to accumulate all the lap time is uh, is not uh, is mean the the more constant at the end of the of the year, and also you know every rider every rider say yeah no but the car we don't need uh, you know but everybody go to see the car oh, man, it's good the car well, maybe yeah. so for sure is 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 very good and also is uh, is good because. Uh, we risk during the practice uh, we make uh, hard work so a, 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 a gift at the end for the best is uh, is, is beautiful and finally the hot summer has brought out many strange things not the least of which is this unusual variation on gravity-powered racing, enjoyed by kids of all ages around the world. The bobby car is one of the first wheeled toys given to youngsters. More than 10 million have been sold since the red plastic toy was introduced 30 years ago. It's the most popular child's vehicle in 30 countries and the most unlikely racer. 35 of them competed in the annual European Bobby Car Championships, and as in all racing, there are costs involved. The wheels are the most important. There are two possibilities, wheels filled with air or solid rubber wheels. You decide yourself what you want to drive. Ball bearings are also very important. There are many different philosophies. And some people spend about 2,000 euros on the ball bearings and the hubcaps. What started as a party gag has now become a serious sport, with clubs, qualifications and championships held annually. To compete in the highest class, drivers need a racing license, and the vehicles that hurtle down the track bear little resemblance to their children's little red car. Motors are not allowed, yet the souped-up cars can reach speeds of more than 100 kilometers an hour on the downhill course. Drivers must wear a motorcycle helmet and protective leathers. I love the speed, the kick that the speed brings. And to go down the course without brakes. I love to be fast and not to break. Just because they're little doesn't mean that they're any less important to their owners. And racing fans will go to great lengths to customise their vehicles. Formula One tragics could opt for the Ralph Schumacher Williams BMW style or a copy of his bigger brother's championship winner. Shumi supporters are everywhere, it seems. The rules state that the racing vehicle can be 75 centimetres long, 45 centimetres high and 50 centimetres wide. It may weigh a maximum of 40 kilograms and the wheels can have a maximum diameter of 24 centimetres. The checks seem crude, but they are effective. While the plastic bodies must remain standard, some extra bracing underneath for safety and strength is allowed. The racing is a bit like street luge, except that bobby cars have steering and a very, very short wheelbase, so that they can turn too suddenly. Onlookers vary from folk who can remember buying the very first models to new parents who'll soon be buying their first bobby. After a series of qualifying rounds, Raymond Oppel, a driver from the southern German city of Coburg, became this year's European champion, with world champion Wolfgang Formberg a close second. Watch out, Michael Schumacher. So, whether you like your motoring perfectly measured, in the wall, or just slipping past, so you stay on track and up to speed, make sure you catch next week's Drive.